for doing the question. All right, Mukund, please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me, Meredith? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so great. So thanks, Meredith. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Sri Momita, for inviting me to this. Uh, it looks like a really amazing forum. I see a lot of old friends in the participants list. So hello, <laughs> glad to have you here. Um, so let me let me get started. So um, Sri asked me to give a pro provocative title, and uh, this is the one I'm going with. Um, and if you think this little splotch or ink blot is meant to represent a cell, uh, it's not. Uh, actually, this little white space here in my, it's a philosophical slide. Uh, this is the space of all possible physical objects and the things in the white space are the space of all sort of possible cells. And uh, why would things not be possible? Is because something about the constraints of physics and thermodynamics means that uh, there's some boundary to what makes a thing alive. Um, and that's something we, a lot of us study with uh, backgrounds in physics. Uh, but there's another kind of constraint that arises often, which is the question of, you know, does biology allow you to discover various ways of building cells? And this is the question of what kinds of genotypes actually naturally arise uh, through the course of evolution. And it's these two things together uh, that uh, decide where an actual cell, which is this little pink dot that you observe, uh, is something you actually see. So in biology, you often just see one thing, but by looking at counterfactuals, how else things could be and what the constraints are, you can actually decide whether the thing you see is surprising, teaches you something new, or whether it's sort of totally uh, expected. So what I work on more generally, uh, I study the evolution of eukaryotic cells. So I have this sort of two billion year playground to work in. Thank you, Susan, for introducing everybody to the processes of endocytosis and membrane fusion. Uh, internal membranes are sort of the defining feature of eukaryotes, um, but they didn't always start that way. So we've actually done work on this entire spectrum, looking at the archaeal ancestor of eukaryotes, uh, looking at how the mitochondrial endosymbiosis worked, how acidification evolved. Um, and these are all processes that get you to a sort of proto-eukaryotic cell that has all the functional protein machinery that you would expect in a present day eukaryote. And this sort of happens a couple of billion years ago. Um, subsequent to that, of course, eukaryotes continue to evolve to the present day. And one of the questions we like to ask is how do these new organelles uh, develop in a eukaryotic cell that has all the basic machinery um, that you would need to make things work? Um, so again, you've already seen a little bit of how membrane fusion works, but let me uh, again remind you. So the way a eukaryotic cell is set up is that there are many membrane bounded compartments inside the cell. We call them organelles. Um, and these compartments are constantly exchanging vesicles. The vesicles carry cargo from one place to another. But the amazing thing is that the compositions of each compartment sort of remains in a steady state. So we can sort of say, this is the ER, this is the Cisco G, this is the plasma membrane, and so on. Um, and uh, this is all set up because of the fact that the vesicles move around in a very specific and programmed way. The, the way they do this is they have, they're studded with proteins on their surface that tell them what target membrane to go to. And there are other proteins called coats and adapters that decide what source membrane to start from and what to package the vesicles with. So it's like a, a cargo trucking system moving between different warehouses. Um, a couple of the proteins uh, were already mentioned that are important. These are RABs, which are sort of membrane identity proteins that come on from the cytoplasm. There are dozens of types of RABs in a cell and they decorate different um, membranes uh, differently. There are also many types of snare proteins which mediate membrane fusion. And so basically you need the correct pair of snares for the right vesicle to meet the right target. So you can write down a sort of biophysical model of all this, which is something a student of mine, Rohini Ramdas and I did many, many years ago to show that uh, a, a simple sort of dynamical systems model where you put in the physical process of protein specificity, membrane budding, membrane fusion, and you let the system run. And what happens is you end up getting a sort of uh, eukaryote looking cell in your computer uh, where there are many different membrane compartments. Each one is exchanging matter furiously, but their, their compositions remain uh, constant. So in a sense, you can get many compositionally distinct compartments, even in this very dynamic system. Um, but then the question arose, um, that's the physical constraint, but you know, how likely is this kind of complex system to arise biologically? And this is where a, a rather beautiful hypothesis, which was pioneered by Joel Dax um, uh, and Mark Thiel comes into the picture. They noticed when looking at the phylogenetic history of the kinds of protein families involved in membrane traffic. Remember I told you there are many kinds of RABs, there are many kinds of snares, but they're all homologous. So they all come from a gene duplication event, phylogenetic, right? And so they sort of noticed that uh, RABs uh, undergo a sort of gene duplication event to introduce a new type of RAB at around the same time in evolutionary history as a snare undergoes a whole genome, uh, sorry, a gene duplication event. And this new copy of the RAB and the new copy of the snare seem to be targeted to a new compartment. So it's almost like compartments themselves arise by a sort of duplication process in an evolutionary sense. 
And uh, what we did was we plugged in this basic idea into our biophysical model and we showed that indeed, if you have RABs and snares and you allow a process in your computer of gene duplication, and then you allow the protein cross interactions to evolve in just the right way, then you can indeed go, and that's what the bottom panel of this slide shows. Um, the bottom panel is a sort of uh, a sketch of different compartments inside a cell in a principal component space that tracks their compositions. And this is in real time, it's in like seconds and minutes. And uh, the little matrices in there are the number of RABs and snares and their cross interactions. And I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but the rough idea is that when you duplicate a protein, initially the two copies are identical, right? So you just have an increase in copy number. So you don't go from three compartments to four compartments just by introducing new proteins. But if the protein cross interactions co-evolve in just the right way, then you have enough substrate machinery to sort of segregate a new type of compartment. And you end up going from a cell that has three organelles, for example, to a cell that has four organelles, right? So this is all, you know, it's very abstract, um, but it does show that this model of organelle paralogy, which tries to link the physics with the underlying genetics is something that is really, um, uh, it's, a, it's a hypothesis that's really worth testing. So the question is how to test it, right? Um, of course, these processes have been happening over billions of years, and uh, you're unlikely to see something happening in the lab, in lab timeframes. Um, another point, which, is, which was interesting, and I didn't appreciate it at the beginning as a physicist. So uh, we've all been taught about this idea that uh, duplicate genes are a very important uh, source of evolutionary uh, novelty. And this idea has really been pioneered uh, by Susumu Ono. Um, and uh, the point about this is that when you have a gene dedicated to a function, it's often constrained. But when you have an extra copy of the same homolog, um, it could be that one of the copies diverges by some symmetry breaking event, and then it's able to take on a new function, new functionalization or sub-functionalization. And, and that's been studied in many, many contexts, right? So we know this picture is actually correct. But the problem with applying that picture to membrane traffic is you don't just need one new duplicate gene. You need duplicate RABs, duplicate snares, duplicate codes, maybe other duplicate lipid targeting machinery. You need the whole set. Um, and that kind of thing. And these genes are distributed throughout the chromosomes. You know, they're not in one place. Um, so to get so many duplicate genes at once, actually, there's only two ways to do it, right? It doesn't happen because of an uh, error in uh, DNA replication locally. And the two ways to do it, one which is very well known, which is called whole genome duplication where uh, a eukaryotic cell uh, in fact replicates its, uh, its chromosomes, but for some reason does not divide afterwards. So it ends up becoming a cell with twice as many chromosomes, so twice the copy of every gene. That's called whole genome duplication. Uh, the other way to do it, which is also fairly common among unicellular eukaryotes, but less um, well studied, uh, at least outside the subfield where it is very well studied, is called hybridization. Hybridization is the case when you have two members of a very similar species. They diverged some time ago and, and now they're distinct species, but they're still in some sense able to cross mate for one reason or another. And when they do that, um, you end up having two copies, not two identical copies of these new genes, but uh, two copies that are still reasonably recently diverged on evolutionary timescales. And those are the two pictures I've shown in this cartoon that's taken from this paper by Tony Gabaldon. Um, What's interesting is that um, it used to be thought that whole genome duplication is a pervasive force in the ancestry of uh, Saccharomyces uh, family, yeast, which you're all familiar with. And it turns out that if you actually look, all those whole, well, those whole genome duplications are actually correlated in time with hybridization. This was an interesting piece of biology, which is new. Um, it says that when you see a whole genome duplication, uh, it tends to be occurring with the recent hybridization. And the reason for that is interesting. You all know about this idea of hybrid sterility, right? a, a horse and a donkey mate, uh, but the mule is sterile. And the reason is because chromosomes have been rearranged and they can no longer make gametes uh, to mate. Now, what happens when you make a hybrid is that the hybrid is, it's maybe it's viable, but it's not really uh, viable for sexual reproduction. But if you accidentally undergo a whole genome duplication after that, then the sister chromatids, instead of being the mismatched chromosomes from the two parent species, they become the two new identical chromosomes that arose from the whole genome duplication. So you end up now with a cell. I'm so sorry, Mukun, but just double checking. Uh, Purushottam pointed out that your slides may be stuck. Do you want us to still be on the slide that starts with many yeah. possible sources? Many, many possible sources. Yeah, this is the one I'm on. Yeah, yeah thanks, thank thanks a lot, Sri. Yeah, so, so actually uh, um, work by Christian Landry has shown that in the lab, if you make hybrids between distinct species, 
they tend to be rather poor at growing, but if they undergo a rapid whole genome duplication, then they become much more viable. Right? So there is an evolutionary pressure to get genome duplication shortly after hybridization. So I'm moving on to the next slide. I hope you can see that. So now it turns out that um, we have a beautiful natural experiment to test uh, which of these two processes, hybridization or whole genome duplication, is likely to be the source of useful new genes on evolutionary timescales. It's hard to do these things in the lab, as I said, things just don't happen that often. Um, but the lager brewing yeast, which is called Saccharomyces pastorianus, um, it turns out to be a hybrid of two different species. Uh, one of them is uh, the yeast that we know and love, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is sort of a German wild isolate. And the other one, which was isolated uh, by uh, uh, Lipkin and uh, colleagues in 2011, is uh, a wild strain, a uh, cold tolerant strain called Saccharomyces eubianus, which comes from Patagonia. And you might wonder how a Patagonian yeast ended up mating with a German yeast about 500 years ago. And uh, you, you could picture it sort of hiking along on some Spanish galleon on its way back from a voyage of uh, exploration and plunder. Um, so I'll leave you with that little story. But the point is that the South American and German yeast ended up around 500 years ago hybridizing to generate Saccharomyces pastorianus. And uh, one in the context of this membrane traffic, you could then ask, where are the German proteins and where are the South American proteins in the context of the hybrid? Are they all just mixed up and they just both go to the same places? Or do they decorate different organelles differently? Do you have sort of specialized uh, German Golgi and a specialized South American Golgi. Of course, I mean a Eubionis Golgi and uh, uh, a Cerevisia Golgi. Um, and this is the question that got us started working on this problem. Uh, but the way we started was not with membrane uh, traffic. We, we started just by characterizing the system. Um, so what we did was uh, my student Ramya uh, got hold of uh, the hybrid and the two parents in the lab. And um, she did a full transcriptome analysis uh, of, of these creatures. And I'm just going to summarize the results, not just of our work, but a lot of work that has come before it. The rough idea is the following. The, the hybrid cell, if you remember, it underwent a hybridization, and then it underwent a whole genome duplication. So it has four copies of every gene. These four copies, we're going to call them onologs in honor of Susumu Ono, which are these recently duplicated copies. And then the two copies from the two parents, they're called homeologs. The onologs are like 98, 99% identical at the sequence level. The homeologs are like 78 to 80% identical at the sequence level. Uh, that divergence is about 18 million years between the two parents. Um, there are occasional times when um, there's a sort of crossover event from uh, uh, a mating and a meiotic uh, process. So it could be that you lose a chunk of chromosome from one parent or another. So I plotted in this uh, orange and blue um, sort of ruler diagram on the bottom. Uh, which genes from the two parents are present in the hybrid. Orange means it's from Eubionis, Cerevisiae, the blue is from Cerevisiae, and these black bars are the chunks of chromosome that were lost from these very early sort of meiotic recombination events. But roughly, if you think about it, out of 10,000 or so genes, uh, each present in 5,000, 5,000 copies, 4,710 are retained from both parents. So this bug has two copies of everything uh, to play with. Um, so we got interested in whether this these two copies, well, it has four copies of everything, right? We got interested in whether this genetic diversity really leads to some sort of functional diversity. Um, so I'm going to zoom in first, although we didn't do this chronologically. Um, this is the right way to present it now that we know what we know. Uh, if you look at the difference between the two onologs, which remember those are the ones that are the whole genome duplicates, which started off identical. But over, the, over time, over the last 500 years, they would have picked up mutations. So if you look at the little phylogenetic trees on the bottom, imagine there's a hybridization event. That's the top of the tree. The parental strain, whether it's Cerevisia eubionis, is ticking along, accumulating mutations at its own rate. Uh, in the hybrid, that chromosome undergoes a whole genome duplication. So you get two orthologs in the hybrid. And then those start picking up mutations. And I plotted on the bottom of those phylogenetic trees the sort of base pairs that you might find at a given locus at the same location in the, parents, in the parent and the two copies in the hybrid. And there are many cases that might arise. The parent might be the same as the hybrid. The parent might be different. If the parent is different, it could be that the parent picked up the mutation, and so the two copies in the hybrid are identical. It could be the hybrid picked up the mutation, so you get sort of a heterozygous suck. Um, and this is, again, something which took us a lot of time to get familiar with because we're not yeast biologists, we're physicists. But it turns out that if you see a mutation that looks like it's homozygous in the hybrid, you would naively think that means the parent is the one that changed. But actually, there's another process that occurs, which is where 
One copy in the hybrid might have picked up a mutation, but there's a process called gene conversion or loss of heterozygosity, where one of the copies in the hybrid overwrites the other one. And what happens then is what was initially a heterozygous site in the hybrid clicks down and becomes a homozygous site in the hybrid. If you didn't know any better, you would have attributed that to a mutation in the parent and said the hybrid did not mutate at all. So I'm just giving you this sort of evolutionary natural history that could happen. The next step, what we did was we looked at the statistics of these many different scenarios as they occurred over entire genes. And that's the little cartoon I've shown uh, on top where you see these axes, which is homo on the x-axis, hetero on the y-axis. And those lines are meant to be the trajectories of individual genes, eubionis copy and the cerevisiae copy. What happens in general is they're all picking up mutations at constant rate. So they're always climbing up the hill. They're picking up more mutations in the parent. You move X one step. If you pick up a mutation in the hybrid, you move Y one step. Because there are two copies in the hybrid, you tend to move in the Y direction at twice the rate as the X direction. So you get this line of slope too. When you have a gene conversion or loss of heterozygosity event, what ends up happening is all the heterocytes end up looking like homozygous sites. So you trade off half your heterozygous mutations to pick up one homozygous mutation. And that event actually leaves a certain quantity invariant, which is the number of homozygous sites plus half the number of heterozygous sites. This is just a trick. And uh, that conserved quantity, which I call the invariant, I'm going to focus on uh, in the next slide. But remember what I'm saying? The parents are mutating, the hybrids are mutating. If you didn't have any gene conversion, you'd be picking up a lot of genetic diversity in the hybrid. But every once in a while, you get this overwriting event and everything becomes homozygous again. So you move to the right on the x-axis and you fall down, boom, on the y-axis. Um, so you know, how do you test this, uh, this idea? So uh, you, you can't really, right? Because uh, although you know that this, this uh, quantity, mm plus 0.5 rm, is invariant under loss of heterozygosity, it's not invariant over time because these genes are picking up mutations at some rate per day, per month, per year. And you don't know what that rate is. So we decided to try something crazy. We said, is it possible that the rate of mutation is the same for the Cerevisiae homologue and the Eubionis homologue in the hybrid, right? Because we're saying that these are autologous proteins, they may be under similar selective pressure. And so if we're lucky, then by looking at one ortholog, we can decide how many mutations should have occurred. And we can check that against the number of mutations in the other ortholog if these loss of heterozygosity events hadn't occurred. If they do occur, then the number of homozygous sites shouldn't be a good predictor across the two parents. The number of heterozygous sites shouldn't be a good predictor, but the homozygous plus half heterozygous should. And when you test that, you get something almost exactly like you should, which is you know, very satisfying. Um, this factor of half arises from the fact that there's two copies, it's one over two. So if you imagine lambda, which is a free parameter, which, we, which really should be half if our theory is correct, and you say, does the number of mutations in one copy from, say, Cerevisiae predict the number of mutations in the other copy from Eubionis. If you use just the homozygous sites, which is lambda is equal to zero, you get a lot of correlation, which means that the orthologs are mutating at a similar rate, which is surprising in itself. Um, if you go to lambda's infinity, which is you're just looking at the heterozygous sites, you get a lot of correlation. But the highest correlation happens when you actually add the two together in about this ratio, right? So this, um, we've gone a lot into the reason for this effect. We can show it's not a chromosomal location effect. It really is coming from two facts. One is that orthologous proteins really are clocking up mutations at similar rates. And the second is that loss of heterozygosity really is a pervasive process that is constantly wiping out the number of heterozygous sites and artificially seems to increase the number of homozygous mutational sites in the hybrid. So I had to introduce all this uh, phylogenetics and biology to the biophysics audience. So I'm, I'm sorry if I took a little extra time, but you know, this is something I really enjoyed doing because it is, uh, you know, it's not in the textbooks, but anybody who works in this area, they would know this you know, intuitively. Uh, and, and in some sense, uh, to pick up all this uh, um, information from, which is very commonly known in one field and apply it to another field is the reason why I enjoy working in this interdisciplinary space, right? So we end up making um, you know, naive hypotheses, but then once you really get to know a field and say that the process of, for example, RNA sequencing can allow you to extract homozygous sites, heterozygous sites, I come back to my familiar world of modeling and statistics, and I'm able to test these hypotheses. Okay, so um, let me now uh, really summarize um, what, uh, what all this means, right? Um, I am, in fact, uh, 
uh, getting through the talk faster than I expected. So I, I hope uh, I'll be able to spend time answering your questions in case I left uh, anything unclear in this process. So um, what's the summary? Well, we looked at this hybrid yeast and this hybrid yeast is a 500 year old hybrid, which has copies of genes from Eubionis from South America and Cerevisiae from, from Germany. Um, and I've said that there's this constant process of loss of heterozygosity that tends to remove orthologous genes, right? So you could ask how many genes from Cerevisiae overwrote the Eubionis copy? How many genes from Eubionis overwrote the Cerevisiae copy? That's, that's, a loss of, that's a major loss of heterozygosity because these are already divergent genes. The answer is almost none. 95% of homeologs, which are the ones from the two parents, are still expressed and retained in the hybrid. The only bits, in fact, that are overwritten are the ones that you see in these very localized stretches of the chromosome, which is, in fact, due to a very, not an, very ancient, but to a 500-year-old uh, meiotic event and chromosomal crossover. It's not due to an ongoing loss of heterozygosity type of process. So first of all, the homeologs, the very distant uh, gene copies are present in the hybrid. Second point, um, are any of the homeologs silenced? Are they all transcribed? Well, we've done the transcriptome. So uh, we know that almost all of them are transcribed. And uh, you could ask, well, we don't know anything about function, but we actually have checked. There's you know, one or 2% that are silenced transcriptionally, but are present in the genome. And you can check up the rate of uh, synonymous and non-synonymous mutation accumulation in those genes. And you can actually see that the transcribed genes uh, accumulate far fewer mutations of uh, a non-synonymous type than the silenced ones. So they are under purifying selection, which indicates they are uh, functional. What about the ploidy uh, of the onologs, which are the ones that arise from whole genome duplication? I know I have two minutes left, Meredith. I'm going to uh, wrap up in the next two minutes. What happens with the onologs? is really astonishing. We can use the number of mutations that accumulated in one species to track how many mutations there should have been from the other parent, even though it's wiped out by loss of heterozygosity. By using this trick, it turns out that over the past 500 years, 60,000 heterozygous sites that would have arisen, out of those, only 9,000 are left because they keep on getting wiped out by this cut and paste overwriting operation. Okay, so really when you look at uh, the source of genetic novelty, it's, you know, hybridization is the source and it's not the whole genome duplication that's the source. So to wrap up, because I, I really teased you with the idea of membrane traffic, Ramya has actually done experiments where we've looked at the expression of membrane trafficking machinery at different phases of growth. We've done uh, localization experiments by adding tags and so on. And I'm just going to show you uh, two examples. One is uh, a Golgi uh, T-snare and the other one is a vacuola T-snare. And what, we use, what you see in this case is that the German and the South American copies of the Golgi T-snares are co-localized in all cells. But if you look at the vacuola T-snare, and we've done all the right controls, it looks like they're not in the same place inside the cell. Now, I'm not saying this is functional. It could be an artifact, it could be some mutation, but I am saying that having extra copies leaves you with a potential reservoir of novel function uh, for future evolution. So that's the end. Um, I work at this uh, really, a fantastic place called the National Center for Biological Sciences, within which we have a group of physicists uh, and computational people at the Simon Center. And we study everything from molecules to ecosystems. This work was done by my former students, uh, Ramya, who's done the hybrid yeast work, Rohini, who did the original gene duplication work, and my experimental collaborator, Sunil Lakshman, who's at a neighboring institute, the Stem Cell Institute, and he's uh, an expert in all things yeast. So next time you sip a glass of beer, just look at all the history and the biology that's going on inside there. Um, and I hope you're inspired by that. Thank you. Okay, great, Mapun. Thank you for a, a very nice talk. Um, yeah, and we have time for some questions. So, um, so let's start with one from um, Santhal um, Aramogan, who asked about in the earlier part of the talk about the compartments. If you know what would be the minimum number of gene duplications <laughs> that would duplicate or form a new compartment apartment with perhaps new dynamics and place in the yeah. hierarchy of, of flow. We well, thought about that. Question. It's a wonderful question. And the way to answer that really would be to do, um, I think a reconstitution experiment. Okay, because it's hard to do this kind of thing in the context of a real cell where there's too much going on. But really you would need uh, a new source of vesicles and a new return pathway of vesicles. So you're talking about not just sort of one new rab and one new snare, but maybe a couple of those, uh, plus additional coats and adapters to work exactly the right way. So you'd need, um, you know, 10 different types of proteins to be present in new copies, 
uh, or at least to take on new functions. Thank you, Mukul. Thanks. Um, so, so then let's go to uh, um, Raphael uh, Petrosian, who asked if the mechanism of the mixing that led to the original hybrid, the Pastorianus, is known. So uh, you alluded Pastorianus to that was, briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Pastorianus was selected for being cold tolerant. Lager is a is a cold brewed uh, uh, beer, which is why it became so popular. It doesn't leave a residue. Eubianus is cold tolerant. It lives in sort of a very uh, cold Patagonian climate, and it's really that aspect of it which got selected early on. It doesn't mean the rest of it didn't add interesting biology, but that's the idea. Okay. And and there are there are enthusiasts who brew beer using Eubianus, and and you know they try and do things with it. Okay. Um, so Gabor Balazi asked about whether loss of hybridization can lower gene expression noise and if that contributes to selecting on what gene gets converted and what doesn't. Yeah, interestingly, we've looked at the transcription profiles and it turns out that in the homologues tend to have much more correlated rate of transcription than in the two parents. But this is probably explained by some work that, for example, Nama Barkai did many years ago, which is that transcription factors can bind uh, to their cognate uh, uh, binding sites, even if it's from the other species, and they tend to bring transcription to similar uh, rates. I don't know how this affects gene expression noise, other than the fact that you'll have twice the copy number, so there's a square root of two effects there. Okay. Thanks. So if they are correlated, that means that uh, the averaging may not be as efficient. That we, uh, exactly. So that uh, extrinsic part, part of the noise Could you cut out just a little bit at the end of that? You, you yeah. started to say the extrinsic part of the noise and then we lost you. Can you repeat? The extrinsic part of the noise will still propagate because the upstream noise uh, comes from transcription factors. Right. Well, uh, thanks for the great talk. Good seeing you, Mukund. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, so Wallace, Wallace Marshall had a question about, um, is the persistence of homologs because they're not recognized as homologous by the recombination machinery and thus not subject to gene conversion? whereas new heterozygous sites that arise are in a context that is otherwise homologous and so gene conversions can happen easily. Yeah, so there's actually a wonderful study uh, in human evolution which shows that you need a certain threshold separation between the orthologs before they escape the process of LOH. Um, LOH tends to happen because of mating between cousins in small unicellular populations and so indeed it's exactly what you said. Sister chromatids wipe each other out but if they're not recognized as chrom, it doesn't happen at the gene level, it happens at stretches of chromosome level and that amount of mutation separation is enough to allow them to escape. Um, good, so I think we'll, we'll stop there with the formal presentation. Thank you very much um, to both Susan and Mukund for, for very